Good morning, Mark. How are you, my man? Good morning, Rover. Thanks. So, um, you've this is your what? How many books have you written? How many? This is my tenth. Ten books. How long does it take to write a book? Because I see it must take incredible patience to write a book. Well, it does. I mean, I I think I've taken as long as five or six years. In this case, there was a little bit more urgency about it. So, I mean, I started work on it the day that Bin Laden was killed, and and it's taken me this long to get it done. I think my publisher would have liked to see it sooner. Yeah, I I know that the one of the Navy SEAL guys he wrote a book. Is there a competition to sort of get things out first and fast to because that that affects sales? Yeah, I think there was, and I pretty much ignored it, um, much to my publisher's chagrin. Uh, but, uh, I, you know, I did decide that uh, I, there are two ways of doing a book like this. One is to wait 10 years, and then you can basically access everyone and everything. And the other is to try to get something out while people are really uh, hungry to find out what happened. So I, I didn't race to be the first, but I did decide that I was going to do uh, the quicker of the two approaches. So right when right when you get the news that Osama bin Laden has been killed, you think to yourself, "Aha! Here's a book." Well, to, to be honest, Rover, I didn't. Uh, I ordinarily would prefer not to be working on a story that everybody else in the world is trying to get. Uh, in the past, generally, the books that I've written have been about things that I was really the only one interested in. Mm-hmm. But in this in this case, actually, a friend of mine who was a movie producer asked me if I would be interested in writing a uh, a script. And I thought, well, hey, that's, you know, it's best of all things. You get paid well, and you don't have to compete with all these other reporters. I could basically draw on their work. So I, I just happened to contact Jay Carney, who is a friend of mine. He's the uh, press secretary for the president. And, and much to my surprise, he responded very positively immediately. Um, saying that he would advocate for complete access for me in the White House. And and then my movie producer friend backed out, and I ended up with tremendous access and no project. So I called my publisher, and he said he'd really be excited about a book. So I went ahead with it. And so you actually interviewed uh, uh, President Obama as part of this. What is that process like? So you have to, I mean, how much time do you get with them? Is it one interview? Do you get follow-ups? How does how does the process work when you go to interview the president over something like this? Well, you you, know, you put in your request. Uh, in my case, I had to wait almost a year, and they eventually budgeted me an hour, which is very generous given the competition to see the president. Mm-hmm. Um, and I ended up getting an hour and a half. He, we, I think he was interested in the conversation. I did not have a chance to come back and ask follow-up questions of him in particular, um, but I had been working on the book for a year or more, almost a year by the time I went in to see him, and so I, you know, I really knew what I needed to get from him, and he was great. So uh, it worked out extremely well from my perspective. Uh, the book is called the uh, the finish, the killing of Osama bin Laden, and. You start out with a little context. You start out with 9-11 in the book to sort of put everything into context, right? Right. I think that's when, for most Americans, the story of Osama bin Laden really begins, even though we've been trying to hunt him down for some years before 9-11. I think that uh, September 11, 2001 is when most most of us heard the name Osama bin Laden for the first time and, and al-Qaeda. Uh, so that, to me, is where the story really starts. And why did it take so long for us to find him and kill him? He obviously was the world's most wanted man. Um, I think we kind of know maybe we got sidetracked in, in Iraq, or, or at least that's been the accusation that we should have uh, stayed and, and hunted down um, bin Laden. But what really took over 10 years to find this guy? Well, Rover, I think what's even more remarkable um, is that we found him at all. Really? Um, oh, yeah, because, I mean, if you want to hide in the modern world, uh, you need to totally remove yourself from the grid. You can't make any phone calls. You can't use any credit cards. You basically have to completely withdraw. You have to cut yourself off from everyone you've ever known, um, family, friends, never make contact with them. Uh, and then you do something like move into the upper two floors of a house in the suburbs of Islamabad and never leave for five 
to six years. I mean, that is about as determined an effort to hide as a person can make. And to me, it's it's just extraordinary that the analysts and at CIA and NSA and <clears throat> the various agencies involved here uh, were able to find him at all. I mean, that to me, that's really what I think the bulk of this story is about and is the most remarkable thing about it. And we got him in a nutshell through a courier, right? It was a guy who he would pass messages to, I guess through, uh, he would pass messages to other people in Al-Qaeda or, or they would pass messages to Osama bin Laden and this guy was a trusted guy uh, for years. And that's how we eventually tracked him down, right? That's correct. Uh, you know, he would issue these occasional uh, video statements that would appear on TV or the internet and um, he would communicate with his uh, followers through these long letters that he wrote. And so one of the avenues that the CIA pursued in going after him, one of many, was this courier network, because they knew that at the end of that network, someone had to actually take something from bin Laden himself. And for years, they had a pseudonym, Ahmed the Kuwaiti. They didn't know who that was, but who had been they'd been told was very close to bin Laden. It took them five or six years just to figure out who that person was, what his real name was. And once they had his real name, uh, they're very good at this now. They found him and they followed him and they found this curious looking compound in Abbottabad. So yes, that's exactly how they tracked him down. Was he, do you think that bin Laden was frightened for his safety during this period of time he spent in that compound, the five or six years? Did he, was, how worried was he? Obviously, he must have been worried about being tracked down. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't lock yourself up in a compound for five or six years. But uh, was he, uh, do you think he thought he was going to be found? Was he frightened? He was concerned, but he was very cocky. Uh, he felt that he would never be found. He considered himself to be, um, an expert on hiding, and in fact he was, and he also knew that he was extremely disciplined, he, which he was. So he would actually write in his letters to his followers if they would just sort of follow his example, if they could do the kinds of things that he had done rigorously enough, then the American drones and special forces would never be able to find them. In fact, he boasted uh, to that uh, extent, he boasted about that in particular in the last letter he wrote, which was just five days before he was killed. <laughs> hey, they'll never find me. Boom, you're dead. Um, exactly. Did, did he have any sort of influence on Al Qaeda? Was he doing anything operationally? Did, did by by killing him? Uh, obviously, we had to go in and either kill or capture him. We wanted to do that highest priority. But did it have any real effect on crippling Al Qaeda? I think it had a tremendous effect. I mean, for one thing, it had a big effect on. The United States, and you felt it probably yourself, I did, in the outpouring of, of celebration and relief that the American people had, you know, when it was announced that he had been killed. He was also, you know, a, a tremendous inspirational leader to al-Qaeda, and for the most part today, al-Qaeda doesn't exist as the organization that bin Laden created. It exists as a kind of cause, and you see all these little, these sort of local extremist organizations throughout that part of the world who will embrace and fly the flag of al-Qaeda. And for them, the fact that bin Laden was alive and at large, you know, 10 years after, almost 10 years after 9-11, was a proof of the sort of enduring nature of their enterprise. So I think it had a big effect uh, psychologically. And then, yes, the, the last point is that he was still... Uh, through these long letters he was sending out, issuing very direct orders to the remnants of his own organization. And, but in fact, that organization had been all but dismantled by um, American attacks. Mark Bowden is on with us. He wrote uh, Black Hawk Down. That was turned into a movie. Most people probably know him for that. He has a new book out called The Finish, The Killing of Osama Bin Laden. How... Well, let's let's talk before we talk about the actual operation. Let's talk about the president's decision to do this. I, I, when when this happened, I went on the air the next day and I said, "This guy, like him or love him or hate him, 
this was probably, in my opinion, the gutsiest decision made by an American president in decades. And people said, oh, give me a break, Rover. Any Anyone would have done that. Anyone would have. Done. <laughs> and, and to go into a sovereign nation and run a military operation in there without telling that nation, um, extremely risky. And if it would have gone, if something would have been, something went wrong and something came close to going wrong, uh, with that helicopter going down. If if those men had been killed, it w- he would have never been reelected, um, and he knows that he would have never been reelected. And it was gutsy in that sense. But uh, I mean, t- talk about the decision uh, to go in, and not only of the president, but but of of everyone um, that that was involved in the decision. How big of a decision was that to go in and and go into Pakistan and get Bin Laden? Well, I think it was huge, uh, you know, if for all the reasons that you just described. <clears throat> you know, if that force, if the SEALs had been discovered during the four hours, roughly four hours that they were inside of Pakistan, um, there was a very strong likelihood that we would have gotten in a shooting war with our ostensible ally, Pakistan. And in fact, you know, at the president's direction, they had beefed up this mission with uh, additional infantry units waiting just inside the border of Afghanistan. They had put the United States Air Force on alert uh, to go in and escort these helicopters out if necessary. And the bottom line there is a lot of dead Pakistanis and probably or or possibly dead uh, Americans. So, you know, there was a huge downside to this. The first and most important one was the, you know, the threat to the lives of the SEALs who undertook a mission. But beyond that, to, you know, our relationship to Pakistan, to what we're trying to accomplish in that part of the world, too, as you mentioned, the possibility of Obama uh, winning a second term. And he gambled all of that with a very uh, uh, relatively tempting uh, option at his disposal that would have had none of that downside, which was just to shoot a small missile from a small drone at the character they called the Pacer, who they all thought was bin Laden. And if they, if he had chosen that option, you didn't have risk anyone's lives. You didn't risk any SEALs or Pakistani lives. You didn't risk a shooting war with Pakistan. That had to have been enormously tempting. And in fact, that's what Secretary of Defense Gates uh, ultimately recommended, as did the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs. So, uh, you know, the fact that Obama chose the riskiest option, um, and also the one that had the largest upside, I think uh, says a lot about his cojones. And he did this just so that we would know that it was bin Laden, right? I mean, that's why we had, they, they wanted to be sure. Is that is that why they decided to do it the way they did it with the SEALs? That was a big reason, and they wanted to be certain that they, they'd gotten bin Laden. And also, it gave uh, the mission the most flexibility, because they you know, they didn't want to shoot people who, who they didn't want to shoot. If it turned out that bin Laden wasn't in the uh, compound, uh, you know, if you drop a bomb on it, you kill whoever's there. In this case, there was always the possibility that the SEALs could get in and uh, recognize that they, you know, these people were not who they thought they were and leave without harming anyone. So it gave the, the mission the greatest degree of flexibility and also the greatest possibility for collecting intelligence uh, and for knowing uh, if you did kill bin Laden for being able to prove that you had. What What's the most, uh, we've heard accounts of this, the, the killing of Osama bin Laden. We've heard from a SEAL who was on uh, on the team, SEAL Team 6, who did it. We've heard uh, there's a movie coming out about it, this Zero Dark Thirty, I think is what it's called or whatever. Um, so the story's been told, but uh, in this book of yours, which is called The Finish, The Killing of Osama Bin Laden, um, what's the most surprising thing that you discovered about the actual operation or, or the most interesting aspect of the actual military operation to go in and kill Bin Laden? I, I found this... Um... <laughs> Excuse me. This decision that the president made to um, order the seals to be prepared to fight their way out, if necessary, was the most surprising thing. Because Admiral McRaven, who commanded the seals on this mission, his recommendation to the president was that if they alerted Pakistan's defenses, that his men should stand down, basically strong point the compound, and wait for Washington to negotiate 
their extraction. And it was the president who said, no, if you go in, I'm not going to leave those men stuck there in that position. You need to be prepared to fight your way out. Um, you know, that I would have thought that the military commander would have had that aggressive approach and the president would have preferred, um, you know, the, uh, the, the negotiating option. And, and it was the opposite of what I uh, what I thought. Because if, if they had come, they were, they were close to a military installation there. If the Pakistanis had come and said, what the hell's going on here, engaged in a firefight that could escalate. Now we're potentially, this is an ally of ours who's not too, would not be too happy about it, but now we're potentially uh, in an international incident, uh, war perhaps, with a nuclear nation. Exactly. And, you know, this is a country that has nuclear weapons, that has very sophisticated ground-to-air um, missile capability, that has F-16s in its air force. So, I mean, th- we're talking about a shooting war. Those... Four helicopters were not going to be able to fly for an hour and a half out of uh, Pakistan without very significant uh, um, uh, support from uh, jet fighters. And and I think you would have seen um, a very serious uh, military confrontation with Pakistan if uh, this had all gone south. And the chances of it going south, to, you know, certainly for anyone familiar with similar missions like the rescue mission to Iran, or the story that I wrote in the book Black Hawk Down, certainly is very aware of how easily and rapidly things can go to hell um, when you're attempting something as difficult as this. And it almost did with that helicopter. I mean, that helicopter, one of the helicopter crashes. Yep. And those guys could have been, I mean, anything. I mean, that that was bad news. It was. I mean, it's, it, it's extraordinary, uh, you know, how close they came. And then, you know, they didn't know as they approached the house on the compound whether they were going to be, uh, they were going to encounter heavy resistance. As it happened, they were shot at, but but only once and ineffectually. Um, but they didn't know that going in, so there was always a chance that they would get uh, in a you know serious firefight on the compound itself. And then you know something that they frequently have encountered in Iraq and Afghanistan is they'll hit a target house, and uh, every every piece of evidence in the house indicates that the target is living there, but they can't find it. Mm-hmm. Uh, oftentimes they're hidden behind trick walls or in, like in Saddam Hussein's case, buried in a, in a bunker underground. And Admiral McRaven had told the president if they get there and they know bin Laden is there somewhere, they're going to have to take the place apart to find him. And in that case, they would have had to very seriously overstay the anticipated 40 minutes, you know, on the compound grounds. Uh, every minute that goes by increases the likelihood that the alarms within Pakistan are going to be tripped. So, do, you, do you think that they would have, uh, did they want to kill him or did they want to capture him? I think that, uh, the, well, the president told me that he would have preferred to have him alive. And he gave me a pretty interesting reason why he thought that would have been best. But um, I don't believe that he... Um, commanded those seals to take every risk to ensure that they took bin Laden alive. I mean, clearly the first priority was for those men to get in and out uh, safely. And so my opinion is that even though their orders were to capture bin Laden, if possible, once they were fired upon as they approached the house, that pretty much sealed the fate of every adult male in the house, because at that point, these men are not going to wait around to see uh, if they're going to be fired upon again. What about the decision to just dump the body at sea? Some people have uh, criticized that decision. Uh, What was the rationale behind that, and do you think that that was a good decision? I think it was a good decision, and, you know, one aspect of leadership is that whatever decision you make will certainly be criticized. But, uh, you know, if they had... If they had uh, buried him somewhere, if he had a marked grave anywhere, it would be a a pilgrimage site for followers and adherents all over the world. This has happened in Medellin, where Pablo Escobar was buried after he was killed, and his grave site is kind of a shrine uh, to people who worship the memory of Pablo Escobar. And that would only have occurred on a much larger scale with um, bin Laden. In fact, they did offer to return his body to Saudi Arabia, which is the land of his birth and where his family resides. And uh, Saudi Arabian authorities said, well, what other plan do you have? 
And they said, well, we're, you know, the other alternative is that we drop his body in the Arabian Sea. And so the Saudi Arabian authorities said, we like your plan. And uh, so they, they dump him at sea, and uh, there were pictures taken of him after he was shot in the head. Uh, yep. Were you afforded any access to see these pictures? I was not, but they were described to me in great detail by those who had seen them there. They adhere, um, at least in my dealings with the CIA and, uh, and the White House and the Pentagon, everyone was um, extremely careful to <laughs> to abide by the uh, uh, rules. And, uh, you know, I didn't get – people will complain about, you know, all the leaks coming out about the story. Well, I can tell you as someone who worked damn hard to get leaks, I, I wasn't able to get it. Did you – and what did they tell you? Uh, Mark Bowden is on with us. His book is The Finish, The Killing of Osama bin Laden. What did they tell you about this, these pictures, the way they describe them to you? What What are these uh... – you know, what would what, what, well, someone to look at they, it? They, the, the pictures of, you know, bin Laden himself show, you know, multiple injuries to his head and to his chest. Uh, they were very gruesome. Apparently, uh, you know, the shots to his head removed a significantly sized portion of the upper part of his head. Um, so he very clearly was, you know, had a, suffered a mortal wound. Um, but then they said that, you know, the pictures have a kind of... Um, Theory and respectful quality, and that they washed uh, the body, they wrapped it, uh, they they laid it out on a platform um, <clears throat> on the side of that aircraft carrier, and uh, and they um, dropped him into the ocean. It's a sort of a traditional method of burial at sea, and so it was a uh, you know calm day. Uh, the person who described the sequence of photos to me says you see you know the body flying off of the platform into the water. You see it. Um, splashing into the water. There's a shot that shows just a slight, you can see it descending. And then the next shot, the ocean is, the Arabian Sea is clear, and there's no sign of him anymore. So it's, I, you know, I find the description of, of those photographs to be kind of moving, actually. You um, you wrote Black Hawk Down. You, you mentioned Pablo Escobar. You wrote a book about uh, him, the famous drug dealer. Uh, you've written this book, The Finish, The Killing of Osama Bin Laden. What is next for Mark Bowden to write? What are you working on? Well, I'm I'm uh, always writing for a Vanity Fair in the Atlantic. Uh, and I have various magazine projects uh, lined up. And I'm beginning work on a book that will take me a lot longer than a year or a year and a half to do about the Battle of Hue in Vietnam. So I wouldn't look for that one for another four or five years. Well, Mark, I appreciate you coming on, and uh, good luck with this book. Again, it's called The Finish, The Killing of Osama Bin Laden. You can get this in stores now or on Amazon.com. Could make a good uh, Christmas gift. And, uh, Mark, we'll have you on again sometime. I appreciate it, my man. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you, Rover. My, my pleasure. Thank you, Mark Bowden.